Good to go. Sweet. All right, cool. Well, um, but cool, we're going to jump on to console theory, um, which is probably one of my favorites because that's when you actually get to start twisting knobs and pushing buttons and stuff. Um, anyways, yeah, so um, what we're actually going to do is um, we're going to talk through it. For those of you on the live stream, you get to actually see me twist and do stuff over here. Um, with the rest of you in the room, you can watch this tomorrow, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no. Uh, but yeah, so basically we're going to talk um, through just some universal mixer concepts. Um, and this is basically any soundboard you walk up to, be it analog, digital, really small analog. <laughs> um, it's basically you're going to have um, most of, if not all of these in one form or another. Okay? So um, basically we start I.O. or inputs and outputs. Every console... You've got to be able to get sound into it and out of it, or else it's kind of useless. Um, yeah, so you've got I.O., um, you've got a preamp, um, which again, we're going to hit all these in detail, um, but we're just going to kind of run through them for now. Um, and typically in most mixers, they appear in this order. Um, some people, Mackie, like to be a little different. Um, but so next you've got a preamp, um, then you've got your EQ section or equalizer, um, then you've got a series of mixed buses, which we'll talk about. Um, then you've got pan pots or pot pans, which is a little more fun to say. No, um, you've got faders, which are the slidey thingies. If anybody's gonna, no, sorry. Okay. Um, anyways, yeah, you got faders, um, and then you've got um, VCAs, DCAs, and groups, um, which basically, again, we'll go into detail. But um, VCA stands for a voltage controlled amplifier. Um, DCA stands for a digitally controlled amplifier. I'll let you guess which one is analog and which one's digital. Um, and then you've got groups, which are subgroups. Um, um, and then most consoles have some sort of routing um, or assignment matrix, um, which is basically what it sounds like. You're routing signal out of the console. Um, cool. So let's hit each of these real quick. Um, so console I.O. Um, if you've ever looked at the back um, of an analog console, um, which, again, I wish I could show you, um, but basically you've got... Um, you've got a series of different, if you look down the back, usually you've got, you know, four or five different, they all look the same, but they're all labeled different, um, and they're all designed to take different types of inputs. Um, so first off, you've got, um, you've got line and mic inputs. If you look before, usually you'll see, you know, two kind of quarter inch jacks on the back. Most of the time, um, one of them is labeled line, um, and the other one, which is usually, you know, three prong and XLR connection, is labeled mic. Um, and essentially what this refers to um, is the level of the signal um, coming off of the source that you're plugging in. Um, so really quick plug, the difference between mic and line level is, which I can grab this, a microphone um, in and of itself puts out an extremely low output level. So that's why you never necessarily see um, a microphone plugged directly into a speaker because you wouldn't be able to hear it. The output level and voltage that actually comes off the back of this, which in case you're wondering, that is an XLR connection, the little three prong, um, which can be used for multiple things. You know, lighting runs um, their DMX control, same, you know, three prong. Um, so it's just the connection type, um, but we're not going to talk about lighting because nobody cares about lighting. No, I'm just kidding. JK, sound guy joke. Okay. Um, anyways, but yeah, so that's an XLR connection. Um, and basically, coming off of this microphone itself, it does obviously generate an output. Um, but it's not nearly enough to hear on its own. Um, so when you're talking about a mic level input, it's that, that jack on the back of the console is designed to receive this low level input. Um, it's designed to be able to take that and process it um, to get it to the level you need. When you talk about a line input, um, the, the higher level, once you get a mic level up, um, you're, you're said to have gotten it to, to line level, which is an actual operating level, which is um, what comes off of like uh, your headphone port on your laptop or your phone or sometimes keyboards. You can just run, you know, a quarter inch cable straight out of it um, and it's already, it's strong. Um, I mean, that, that's considered line level, um, which there is an actual scientific equivalent. When we get back to dB, it's um, the kind of standard operating level is plus four dBU. Um, so if you ever see on the back, sometimes you've got an option um, to take it in at either negative 10 or plus four. If it's all pro audio equipment, um, you know, one of those two is, is going to fit, um, but that's, that's kind of what, it, what it's referring to. Um, but essentially, as a um, kind of universal, again, I wouldn't necessarily quote me on this, even though I'm technically being recorded, um, but as a general level, you're trying to get everything to line level um, so that it has, basically, it has enough juice to get through the entire console to be processed by all the various circuitry and make it out with enough power that you're still going to be able to hear it, if that makes sense.
Um, so that is the difference between line and mic. And typically, most consoles, the mic input is an XLR input, um, and the line input is a quarter inch input. And that's because you know most of the time, um, going to be coming off of that. It's kind of to help you technically. You know, could you receive a mic level input on a quarter? I mean, yeah, they're just physical connections, but they do that to kind of help you sort them out and kind of keep apples with apples and so forth. Um, cool. So the next one we have, so those are both input. Those are input points into the console. That's how the console will receive signal from an outside source. Um, then some of the, sometimes you will see what's called an insert. Um, and basically, this is a single jack um, that can both send and return audio um, via that one jack. So if you've ever looked at, which I didn't think far enough ahead to actually grab an example, but I think I have one right here. Da, da, da. Okay, cool. Hopefully you can see this. Um, if you've ever looked at the tip of one of these cables, I do not know if you can see this on the live stream, but basically you notice we'll have um, you know two sections on them. It'll have a uh, tip and a sleeve, as where this one has three sections. You see the two little black lines here. You've got a tip a ring, and a sleeve. I mean, if you look at like your headphone jacks, you know, most of the time they've got three. Um, and basically, um, what that does is allows you, um, you know, if you're talking headphones and such, um, the tip and the ring are left and right. That's how you're able to hear stereo sound over one cable. You're able to hear two, technically two separate sounds over a single cable. Um, and that's how, how it achieves it. Um, when you're talking about insert points, um, the, the tip of the cable is considered the send and the ring is the return. So when you plug in an insert, basically on the back of the channel, it takes whatever's coming in the input of the channel um, and it sends it out via the tip of that cable um, out to, you know, you could plug a compressor in line this way, a limiter, some kind of outboard processing um, that you want the entire input of the channel to run through. Um, so again, most of the time this is something like a compressor. So basically you've got like the cable I just had here, it's called an insert cable. It is, you know, a TRS or tip ring sleeve on one end, and it splits out to two um, TS cables on the other side. So basically, two mono or where it's just got the tip um, and the sleeve um, on the other end. So basically, one of those is a send, the other is a return. So when you plug it into the insert, um, it effectively routes the channel or the the input of the channel out and back in um, via that one jack. So again, that's helpful in the analog realm for setting up things like compressors. You know, say I've got a mic and I want to put a compressor on it. I want to insert that compressor because I want 100% of that mic signal um, to go through that compressor. I want it completely affected. Does that make sense? Cool. So inserts, to put it shortly, they are not inputs. Um, they're different. Technically, in some places, you could um, get a signal into an insert, um, but that is not the correct way to do it. <laughs> we'll just say that. Um, but anyways, yes. Yeah, so then also, you will have... Um, after you get through that, a lot of times consoles will have a direct output, um, which basically direct output means it is literally taking the output directly from the input of the channel. So it's basically taking whatever's coming in the input and sending it out. Um, so this could be, you know, maybe you want to you do a multi-track recording or something like that. You don't necessarily want all the EQ and stuff that you're doing um, for the room you're in to be recorded. You just want to clean or feeding uh, like a monitor system. Like, you know, we use AVMs here and you don't want compression stuff that's happening um, for the house mix to apply to the avioms or to the monitor mix so you take a direct output so it's just taking the output and set or the input and sending it directly back out um, and then you've got um, your main typically you know XLR that's to feed your speakers and such um, and then you've got matrix outputs um, which we'll touch a little bit more on matrixes matrices um, in a bit um, but basically um, a matrix is it's a it's an output matrix so it's it gives you the ability to take you know one mix and output it several times in, in to different destinations. Um, cool. Any before we jump to the next, cool. So that is your inputs and outputs that you will typically see um, on any kind of console. <coughs> All right, we're going to talk um, about preamps now. So again, the first thing in that chain um, is the preamp, um, which if you can see, does it matter um, on this console? Is there a side that you can see better or not necessarily? Cool. All right. Um, for you guys uh, there, basically at the very top um, of any soundboard, you will see um, the gain knob, um, which essentially it's the gain system. Um, and what it's controlling is a preamp, which is called a preamp because it is um, basically amping up whatever signal is plugged into it um, pre of all the processing. Um, so the goal of a preamp, you're bringing the input level up to line level to be usable 
um, by the circuits that are following it. So just we've talked about the level that comes off of a microphone by itself. If I were to just plug this directly into speaker, um, unless the speaker has you know some kind of preamp built into it, you're not going to hear the microphone because it's not it's not outputting enough power on its own. So what you want to do is you want to hit it, um, so that it amps it up before everything. Now you can hear it. Now the rest of the circuitry in in the console can can process it and it's it's at a usable level. Um, and the other thing, the little red light, the overload, the clipping. Um, some people get very nervous about this. I will tell you on. On an analog console, you know, okay, in general, clipping, you know, you want to stay away from it. Um, but the truth is, clipping does not actually hurt the circuit. You could run it in the red all day long, and it's not basically what it's what the clipping light means. The overload light means is that it it, it can't it can't output any more signal. Basically, it's reached its max. You're not killing the circuit. You're not going to let out the magic smoke that makes everything work. You're it, it's not going to hurt it if that makes sense. Um, um, now, I will say the analog distortion um, versus digital sounds completely different. Analog distortion, um, distortion being if you over um, can sometimes actually sound pretty good. You got a kicker snare kind of just crunching through the preamp and sometimes it can sound really good. Um, I have never heard this the case on a digital console. Digital console because it's all ones and zeros it sounds like you're beating someone over the head with something. Um, so in general you know um, even though and on digital it's still you're not hurting the preamp circuit you're not going to um, but I highly discourage it on a digital console. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, so preamps again, the whole goal is to get the mic to a usable signal. Um, now, in some consoles, in this section, the preamp section, you'll have a few other, um, you'll have a few other controls, which if you look um, up here, you've got um, a, what's called a plus 48 volts, um, which is basically, it's what's referred to as phantom power, which is um, certain types of mics, um, condenser mics specifically, um, the way that they're constructed, the way the element works, they need um, a voltage supply to them to be able to work. Um, and so they, you know, in the past it used to be some kind of external power supply. You'd literally plug into the mic or you'd have to run it through a power supply to be able to, to power it up. Um, and they finally went ahead and put that in consoles themselves. And so what it does is it sends 48 volts down the line to power the microphone. So some consoles let you do this on a channel by channel basis. Other ones, um, it's kind of a global. Um, and let me just tell you from personal experience, you do not want phantom power going to your laptop headphone port. It will not work. You will let out the magic smoke. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, so be careful when sending phantom power to things that don't need it. I'll say that. Um, but yeah, and then so normally you've got um, you've got that. Sometimes it'll say, you know, like just a P for phantom or it'll say plus 48 volts. Um, and then really quick, the other two little buttons you've got here um, on this will be on just about any console. You've got one that says polarity um, and then one that uh, says line or pad. And basically, um, and again, the, the actual functionality of these will vary from console to console. Um, but um, when you see the term pad, basically what this is doing is say, um, say you're running a line level signal, pretend it's off of a keyboard or something, um, and your gain knob, your preamp is all the way down. You're not adding any gain to it. You're not, and you're still clipping. Um, the level coming in, it's, it's just too much for that input to handle. Um, a lot of times you'll see um, a pad or an attenuation or a negative 20. It'll say one of those, and basically you hit that button, and before the preamp, it steps down the input level um, by, I mean, it's different by, I think this one is, um, I think it's a 20 dB pad. Um, or sometimes you see these on like DI boxes. Um, they'll have a pad on there, and it, basically all it is is to step down the input level before it hits any circuitry. So it's basically the opposite um, of the mic level. You know, mic level, you need to turn it up. Sometimes the level coming in, um, it's just too loud. You can't, you can't turn it down anymore. So that's what a pad is for. So then you can actually use your preamp and you can get some good good sound out of it. Um, so that's what that is. And then the polarity, um, which some um, sometimes you'll see this um, as a phase, you know, a little zero with a line through it. Um, and um, basically what this does, if we jump really quick back to our slight theory lesson earlier, um, basically it takes um, everything. In fact, let's jump back to this one. <coughs> Just kidding, that one looks terrible. <laughs> um, it takes basically the positive side um, and it will flip negative and it takes the negative side, flips it, makes it positive. So it basically takes your entire waveform and it flips it. Okay. Um, the reason you would want to do this, um, again, I think, I don't remember if we talked about this in this session, but I'm going to hit this really quick. Um, you know, again, we said that you know, when multiple waveforms interact, um, they will add and subtract from each other's volume. So you've got slightly out of time. You know, there's going to be, when they're in time in the positive domain, they're going to add together to be twice as loud. 
um, and then when they're in the negative, they're going to be twice as quiet. Um, basically, if I were to take identical waves, and if you can kind of track with me on this, so I've got one, here's positive, here's negative, um, and then I play a second identical wave um, that's um, basically an in exact same time, amplitude, frequency, but I'm going to start it on the negative um, and then the positive. So as what's said to be 180 degrees out of phase, what's actually going to happen is you are going to get absolutely no sound because it will completely cancel out. You've got you know, the positive with its inverse of the negative here. Those together equal zero. Same thing with this side. So you will actually get complete cancellation. In practice, um, a lot of times you'll see, um, for example, on a snare drum, you'll see a top and a bottom mic on a snare drum because there's totally different sounds on the top and the bottom. Um, and what, what happens, if you think about it, let's just say for a second my hand is the snare head. If I've got one mic pointing down, okay, when a drummer hits this, it's hitting down, the sound is moving away from the microphone, right? Now, if I've got another one down here, when it's moving away from the top one, it's actually moving towards the bottom one. So it would be negative on this one, but it's actually positive on this one. So that means that at the exact same moment in time I'm going to hit that, I'm going to have an identical positive and negative, which means if I don't um, invert the phase of one of them, I'm going to get phase cancellation at specific frequencies, um, which when you hear it, it'll sound hollow, and we'll actually illustrate that later. Um, but that's so in practice, things like that, when you've got multiple mics on a single source, there's going to be some kind of phase interaction. Um, sometimes it'll be negative, sometimes it'll be it'll be. Um, that's why they put that type of button on there, um, is so that if there's a, a phasing issue like that, you can flip the polarity um, and get it timeline, get them in polarity with each other, so everything's moving at the right time and negative at the right time. Does that make sense? Cool. So that's what polarity. Um, some, some again, you'll see it referred to as phase. This is, in my opinion, not correct because phase could be any point in time. It could be, and that's that's irrelevant. It's positive and negative. Is there a question? Uh, yes, um, a preamp is basically um, uh, sometimes on on some lower level consoles you'll see it. The the word there printed is trim, um, but there in a lot of places there actually is the preamp um, will actually it's actually amplifying the signal, whereas a trim um, is uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain it. Um, it it can turn down the signal. It's almost the opposite. So a lot of times you'll see on digital consoles you'll have basically an analog preamp and a digital trim. Um, and basically what that is, the analog preamp is actually stepping up the level, um, and then a trim is bringing it down after that. So the level hitting the preamp, the saturation of the preamp is still the same, um, but the actual output level, the volume level coming off of it um, is different. So it's almost like a volume level as opposed to an actual amplifier level. Um, but some, some of the smaller consoles they do, and some you know, brands use all different kind of terminology. Um, so some of them, they will call it a trim. Um, where, again, technically it, it's a preamp, um, but they, they use different terminology. Um, but yeah, so I think it depends on, it depends on the board. Uh, but usually, if it is a knob at the top, it is a preamp. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, and honestly, again, you can tell, um, usually around the knob, um, you'll see some numbers printed. Like this one goes from negative 14 to positive 60. Um, so usually a gain knob, you realize, okay, there's way more on the positive end than there's a negative end. It's probably a preamp. Whereas on a trim knob, you might see negative 60, and it may only go to plus 6. And you realize, okay, that's, that's a trim. That's not necessarily adding gain. So it's a little, it's, it looks the same, but if you look at the data that's around it, you can kind of figure out the difference. Um, but yeah, um, so again, so that's a preamp. Um, any other questions before we jump? Yeah. Um, what makes a preamp, like I've heard a lot about, like is mm -hmm. it a good sounding preamp? Or is it yeah. Like good um, basically, what it breaks down to, and, and this is you know a whole a whole another you know art form. I would say this is you get into like guitar amplifiers and what makes this sound better than that. But basically, it's in the circuitry and the way um, you kind of have. You've heard there's uh, class A circuits and um, class C circuits, um, and basically, it's all it's in the construction and the actual um, elements that are used to amplify that signal. Everything down from the actual um, capacitors and stuff that are used in line. Um, and the components that's used, all those other components, and so there's a, there's a lot to go into it. And honestly, I'm not like I know very little about that, um, but I know there's plenty of it out there. But basically, it is it's it comes down to um, the the quality of, of the circuitry. The class, you know, you always hear class A circuitry, um, and yes, that's a quality thing, but it's also um, the 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 method in which that's the signal. Um, so if you want some fun, you can go Google 
you know, class A versus class C amps, and you'll find a plethora of information on that. Way more than I <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that's essentially it comes down to the, the actual build of the preamp itself and the components. Um, yeah, so that is preamps. Again, the goal is to get your mic that you've plugged into your soundboard um, up to a usable level so that you can hear it and that it sounds good. It's not clipping off part of the signal and it's not so quiet that you're pushing your fader all the way up to the top and you can't get any sound out of it. Cool? Um, cool, so let's jump on to EQ or equalization. Um, or for you Aussies, I'm sorry I misspelled that. That should be an S. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so um, really quick, um, when it comes to EQ, um, there is um, what I, and this is actually, I will say, um, I'm slightly stealing this from a guy that I admire a lot. His name's Dave Ratt, 30 year engineer of the Red Hot Chili Pepper, phenomenal brain. Uh, but he explained um, EQ this way, and it's stuck with me ever since I heard it. But basically, there is. Um, there's three different um, stages or methods of EQ, um, and they all have specific purposes. The first one being um, there is component EQ, which is basically it's what it's matching. You know, every stage of EQ has a purpose. The component EQ is matching. You know, if you look at, take for example, this speaker enclosure right here. You've got a tweeter up at the top. You've got a, a cone on the bottom, and you've got an enclosure it's in. The component EQ is matching that specific cone and that tweeter to the enclosure that they're in. Um, so that the sound that comes out of that speaker as a whole, excuse me, um, sounds sounds good, sounds the way it should. The enclosure isn't necessarily coloring the sound in in a way that you wouldn't want it to. Um, so 99.9910 percent of the time um, nowadays, manufacturers take care of that. Um, you know, when you get a speaker, it's 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 built, it's ready to go. You plug in, and they've taken care of all that. Um, but that is an important stage of EQ when you get into higher level systems. Um, but then you've got the next, the next kind of phase of EQ um, is uh, the system EQ, which the purpose of system EQ um, is to match the speakers to the room. To match, so this isn't necessarily correcting for issues on a microphone. Oh, my voice sounds weird. You know, you don't worry about that in system EQ. Um, system EQ, essentially, um, what, what, you know, you stick a speaker in a room, and you know, we talked about um, you know, the way sound moves through a room. It's naturally, it's going to reflect off of walls. It's going to be absorbed by carpet and people. So naturally, um, what's being put out right at the source of the speaker um, isn't necessarily exactly what you're going to hear in the room um, or what it's designed to put out. A good example of this is um, if, uh, if you've heard the term pink noise. Um, basically, pink noise or white noise um, is basically static. It's what you hear on a TV back in the old analog TV days when there was nothing on the channel. Um, but basically what that is, is it's every single frequency of the audible spectrum. So 20 hertz all the way up to 20 K hertz, which is considered kind of the audible of human hearing. Um, it's every frequency put out at the same level. Um, so when you hear that shh, that, that's what it is. Um, and pink noise, quick little fact, difference between white noise and pink noise. White noise is literally um, every frequency at the same level, whereas pink noise is frequency at the same level with the Fletcher Munson loudness contour curves taken into account. So you hear white noise is usually really, really harsh, and it usually it sounds a bit higher or a bit, whereas pink noise almost sounds warm, it has more low end, and that's because it's taking into account the fact more sensitive in these higher frequencies, um, so naturally those are going to come. So it's basically white noise ran through a Fletcher Munson equalizing contour curve, and then you're hearing it. If that makes sense. Um, but yeah, so you know, for example, so let's say I ran pink noise out of the speaker right here um, and put it out, put out by that speaker is um, every frequency at the same level. Um, now, if I set a mic up at that end of the room that you know is directional, or I'm sorry, omnidirectional. Um, heard every frequency at the same level, no coloration by the mic itself. What I would hear is, yes, that pink noise, but the effects of the room on that. So maybe it's coming out and it's reflecting off the TV screen there and the walls, and by the time it hits the mic, you know, let's just say 500 hertz has doubled up off that wall and, you know, 20 hertz is built up in that corner, and even though that probably can't put out 20 hertz. It's <laughs> Anyways, um, but basically the point being that what's actually going to hit the mic is different than what's actually being put out. Um, from the from the output of the speaker, um, just because of the effect of the room. So system EQ is used to take those differences. So again, let's just keep it simple. Let's say um, you know because of the TV screen, 500 hertz, you're putting it out at one level from that speaker, and the microphone is picking it up twice as loud at the other end. You know, okay, that's not the speaker because I know what I'm I know I'm putting out everything at the same level, but what I'm hearing is this frequency twice as loud. So then I would go to my system EQ. And I would half the volume of 500 hertz. Now, boom. Okay, now 
we're back to an even playing field. Does that kind of make sense? So again, the system EQ is matching the speakers to the room. That's its purpose. Um, and then you get to channel EQ, which is all these beautiful knobs on the console. And that its purpose is to match the microphone to the source, so to the voice snare to the instrument whatever it is the purpose of channel EQ isn't necessarily to correct for for room so for example let's say I stick this speaker in a corner and quick little fun fact um, low end frequencies double up in corners and come back um, basically what happens if you've got I'm getting a little off topic here but I promise it's helpful you've got a corner here basically you stick a speaker in the corner um, it's going to come out it's going to reflect off here reflect off here and basically it's turning around 90 degrees and going back out that way um, so sound doubles in corners. We'll just leave that at that, but for the record. So let's say I take um, that speaker, stick it in a corner, and I start talking, and I'm like, wow, my voice is like really muddy. It's super low. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to come to my channel EQ and dial all that out. Where the problem actually isn't the mic itself. It's not, my voice isn't muddy. My voice, it's the fact that the speaker hasn't been matched to the room. It's doubling up in that corner, the effects of the room. Um, so that would be something I'd want to go and shift on my system EQ not my not my channel EQ, if that makes sense. Is that is that is everybody tracking? Cool. Um, so again, so component EQ matching um, you know speaker components, system EQ matching speakers to the room, channel EQ matching microphones to sources. Okay, cool. So that that's important because obviously there's a lot of EQ that happens, um, and so knowing where to do, where to address various problems is important um, or else what's going to happen, you're going to you know, start tweaking all this stuff on your channel EQ that's really compensating for the room. So you're maybe you know, 200 hertz, this low is kind of building up in the room. So you're finding yourself cutting it on every single channel across the board and when all, really all you need to do is go to your speakers, pull out you know, 200 hertz and now, boom, now you've got all these bands of EQ left to use for, for other things. Um, cool, does that make sense? Sweet. Um, so we're going to talk about types of EQ. Um, so there are different within this, um, and usually a lot of these will be, uh, multiple of these will be on, on a console. Um, but you've got a shelving EQ, which I'm actually going to draw out here because it's going to be easier. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, so basically a shelving EQ. Um, we're going to say this right here. Um, so, okay, just so everybody knows, this is amplitude. Okay, going this way, um, and this is frequency, going this way. All right, um, so basically, so we'll say, you know, it's right in the middle, say that's, you know, 1K, 1,000 hertz, right in the middle. Um, so basically, a shelving EQ, um, this is typically what you see in, like, your car stereos, when you see bass and treble, um, you know, those very simple controls, um, this is what it's talking about, it's a shelving EQ. Basically, when you set a shelving EQ, there's a set corner frequency. Um, so let's say it's up here, a very standard one for a high is 12K hertz, um, 12,000 hertz, which if you look, a lot of times little Mackie or Behringer consoles, the smaller ones, they don't, basically you can't select a frequency, it'll have printed on there like 10K or 12K or something, and it's basically saying it's a fixed frequency. Um, and a shelving EQ, the way it works is from that corner frequency, it acts like a shelf, up or down everything above that frequency. So this would be a high shelving EQ. Um, or the same thing works on the low. So if it's a low shelving EQ, let's say it's down here at 80 hertz, okay? Um, which this is not to scale on the frequency spectrum, for the record, disclaimer. Okay, um, but basically, um, again, shelving so that and everything below it, if you boost or cut, that's what's gonna happen. So if you can see um, up here on the screen, um, you've got this low one here, is, it's a low shelving EQ, and you can actually see this is imprinted on the console right there to tell you that, hey, this is a shelving EQ. So if I take this and I turn it all the way to the left, I turn it all the way down, what I'm doing is I'm making a shelving cut at this whatever frequency, which this one is 80 hertz, and you see there's a little negative 15 pl pl uh, printed on there. So if I turn it all the way to the left, essentially what that's telling me is I'm taking 80 hertz and everything below it and turning it down by 15 dB. Okay, um, so the next type, um, well actually, okay, yeah, so that's shelving. There's fully parametric EQ, um, semi-parametric EQ, and bandpass. Um, I'm going to kind of lump these into one because it's, it's easier to explain um, this way. Um, so this is a shelving. This bandpass EQ is the other, the other type of EQ, which um, it can also be referred to as like a, what's called a bell curve, where basically what happens is you have a center frequency. Um, just like this, you have a corner frequency. 
um, for, for bell curves, you've got a center frequency, we'll call it 1K. And basically what happens is, let's say I want to boost my center frequency, uh, let's just call this, you know, 6D, capital B, because Alexander Graham Bell. All right, um, so we'll call it 6DB. So let's say I want to boost 1K all the way up to 6DB, okay? So I want to get it to right there. If I do that, um, the way that bandpass frequencies work, it basically it passes um, a specific band of frequencies. Um, so again, not a single frequency. So if I'm, if I, you know, come up, as you can see on the camera, and I boost one of these mid-range um, up, what's actually happening, it's a bell curve. So it's not only boosting 1K, it's also boosting in a shape around it. So it's affecting frequencies on either side of, of that. So it kind of creates a curve. Um, and sometimes you'll see, you know, super high end consoles that none of us in this can afford in churches. <laughs> um, but they actually have selectable, um, uh, you know, curves. So you could have, you know, kind of a really narrow curve like that where it's pretty honed in on that center frequency. Um, or there's other ones that, I mean, it's a pretty broad, a pretty broad stroke, if that makes sense. And same thing with cut. So as I cut, if I want to cut by um, 6 dB, then it's going to look something like that. Okay? So kind of broad strokes. Anyways, you get the idea. So it's not only affecting the center frequency, it's affecting frequencies on either side of that as well. Um, give you parameters to both select the center frequency. This is where fully parametric and semi-parametric come in. Um, a semi-parametric EQ basically gives you um, control over the center frequency, so I can select that, I can move it up or down and pick where this happens, um, and then I can turn it up or down. So I get two controls, which if you look on here, that's exactly what I have. I don't know if you guys can see colors from there, but there's a green knob and a blue knob. And basically the green one is selecting my center frequency, so the frequency is printed on here, so I basically use that one to select, okay, maybe I don't want 1K, maybe I want 3K. So I'm going to move this whole thing down here, now my center frequency is 3K. And then the blue one is my amplitude. So now I'm turning it up by or down. So now this is going to happen up here. Does that make sense? Cool. So that is a semi-parametric. The difference between a semi and a fully parametric, fully parametric gives you a variable control over the bandwidth, or the Q is what it's referred to mostly, um, which is the range of frequencies on either side of the, of the center frequency that are affected. So the, a really narrow Q, which just for ease of seeing. If this is my center frequency, a really narrow Q would be something like that, where it's sitting, it's pretty tight, it's not affecting a huge on either end. Whereas a super wide Q would be something like, I mean, well actually, more of a curve than that, I cannot draw. But you get the idea, the Q, basically how, how wide on either side of the center frequency um, is this booster cut going to affect. So a fully parametric EQ gives you control over amplitude, center frequency, and bandwidth or Q. Um, Semi-parametric, you don't get the Q control. The, the curve is set already. Um, so does that make sense? Is that cool? Those are, um, when you're actually turning knobs, whether it be analog or digital, that's essentially what's happening um, under the hood. So um, that is EQ. Yeah? Can you have more than one? Yes, definitely. In fact, um, this one has, and that's if you've heard of like, uh, you know, three band parametric or four band parametric, or um, that, that's what it's referring to. So like a, you know, for example, on this one here, I have a high and a low shelving EQ, and then I have two semi-parametric bands in the middle. So my, my high mid and my low mid, um, they give me a control over the center frequency and the booster cut. So this would you know, essentially be a four-band semi-parametric EQ. So I've got high and low shelving, and I've got two bands of semi-parametric in the middle. Um, so yeah, and then some consoles, like you know, this little one we're using over here, basically it just has three fixed. It has a high shelving, a low shelving, and then just a standard mid frequency that's that's one of those bell curves you can't select the frequency it's set i think at like two and a half k normally if you got high mid and low nine times out of ten it's 12 k two and a half k and 80 hertz um those are kind of the get and those are, i mean that's you know there's been some thought that's gone into that and some consoles will do different but those are kind of your your set um but yeah so and we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about eq later when we actually get into mixing um but yeah so um next thing mix buses um <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so mix buses, the term buses, they carry signal from one place to another. Um, there are usually multiple mix buses um, on any given console. So there are primary mix buses and there are auxiliary mix buses. So you've heard the term an aux mix, 
you know, an aux or a monitor mix. That's, it's basically you have your primary mix buses, which are going to your speakers. That's, you know, usually it's a left, right. You hear it referred to as a stereo bus, um, a two mix, a, I mean, all, again, all kinds of different terminology. But that's your primary mix bus. You're taking all of your inputs, you're mixing them, you're sticking them on a bus, and you're sending them somewhere. Okay? Um, auxiliary mix buses are, hey, there might need to be a secondary mix besides just what's coming out of the speakers. So we're going to put in all these auxiliary mixes that you can use for whatever you want. It could be a monitor, it could be for subs, it could be for a lobby feed, you know, a, a mother's room feed, any kind of thing like that. It's just an auxiliary mix. You can mix in the same amount of inputs. It works exactly the same as your primary mix, but usually they give you a different type of control. Um, like over here, the, the, your primary mix bus is all on faders. Um, just because that's convenient, and your aux mixes are on rotary, but they literally work the exact same way um, as the primary mix bus. They're all mix buses. So if you kind of get that term um, in your head. Uh, but yeah, so that is, um, and again, that, I mean, literally there is, um, which we'll get slightly more into this later, but with each, each mix bus, um, you know, the, the, the reason I call it a stereo bus, like on the main ones, because there's literally there's two rails, and all the terminology works with this bus, so there, there's a reason they call it that. Um, but there's, a, there's, an, there's an odd and an even rail, left and a right, um, one and two, three and four. It's, it's odd and even. Um, and usually for aux mixes, um, auxiliary mixes, these are auxiliary mixes. They're mono, they're single rail. It's just one. If you wanted to have a left and a right, you'd have to gang two of them together, and one of them is a left, one of them is a right. So usually aux mixes have a single rail um, on the bus, and the primary mixes are stereo, stereo buses. They've got an odd and an even rail. Um, so more on this later when we get into routing. Um, but again, mix buses take inputs, and they stick them on a bus, and they carry them to an output. Okay? Make sense? Sweet. Um, so usually, so again, uh, we're moving down the line. We hit the EQ circuit, um, uh, and then you get your mix buses, which are usually, you know, aux, which I'll touch really quick on this, um, the difference between pre and post fader. Um, usually comes up about this point, and basically it is as it sounds. Um, if an aux is set, if an aux is set to pre-fader, basically means that um, the signal that is going onto that bus and being sent out is it's getting its signal pre for my primary mix bus before this fader down here. Um, it's going to take its signal before any of that. So that means that whether I have this maxed out or all the way down, it's not going to affect the amount of signal that's being sent out that mix bus, okay? So this is helpful for things like monitors. You don't, again, you don't want a monitor mix being affected by, you know, how much I have turned up or down in the house. You want it, when you set it, you want it to stay. Um, now the other, you know, again, then you've got a uh, post fader. So that basically, again, as it, um, as it sounds, it would take signal post this fader. So that means if I have this fader down, um, absolutely no signal is going out of that mix bus. If I have it up, then that, this is also controlling the amount of signal that's going out of that mix bus. Does that make sense? And the post fader would be for things like, um, like effect sense. So, you know, if I've got a reverb on a vocal, um, when I turn the vocal down, I don't want the reverb still going. I don't want it still sending to the reverb because there's no, there's no signal, there's no vocal to, and it sounds really weird when it's all reverb. So, you, you know, you'd have it, you set your ratio of, you know, how much of this input you want sent on that mix bus. Um, but if I have a post fader, then it's also, it's also controlled by um, by this input fader. Does that make sense? So again, pre-fader, it takes a signal before the fader, which means the fader will not affect it. Um, Post-fader means it's after the fader, the fader will affect it. Cool? Um, sweet, so that's that. Um, next we've got panning pots, um, which um, basically this is, they're used honestly for way more than people give them credit for. Uh, but um, in a primary mix bus setup, this is typically just left to right. The panning is, okay, do you want to hear it more to the left side, more to the right side? Um, so, it, But it's more than that. It's when you've got multiple mix buses going, it's actually bouncing a signal between the odd and even rails of a mix bus. So even though you're talking your primary mix bus, you've got a left and a right. Um, it, it is odd and even. So when you're left or right, it's, okay, I'm leaning more heavily on my odd rail than my even rail, so forth and so on. Um, and why this comes in handy is because later um, you also use them for assigning um, groups um, like most analog consoles. And you've got, if you see these four red faders here, these are subgroups. And if I want to get signal to them, um, my pan pot is what I use to assign, again, between odd and even rails. So, um, for example, let's say I want to get, um, say my first channel down here, um, I want to get it to this first subgroup. So obviously one 
is an odd number, okay? So I need it on my odd rail. So that means I, I would want to pan this left, but it's not just left. If it's going to my main mix, it's going to be left because that's the mix I'm sending it to. But if I also send it to, um, which you guys can come take a look at this during the break, um, but for those of you that can see, I've got this little the left, right, one, two, and three, four buttons here. And basically what that's doing is it's, those, those are pointing um, to the various mix buses that I have, the various output buses that I have. So if I select one and two, now this input channel is being routed to uh, subgroup one and two. Um, so now if I just leave my pan in the middle, it's being sent to e evenly to both the odd and the even rails. Sorry, poor word choice there. It's being sent equally to both the odd and even rails. Um, so if I wanted to just get control on one of them, I would have to tell it, okay, I want it on my odd rail. So I pan it left or to the odd side, and now the second one, the even side, won't affect it because none of it's going to the even rail. It's all on the odd rail. And vice versa, if I pan it over to the odd rail, then it's going to come just off the, or I'm sorry, the even, the even rail. Okay? Now, if I have it assigned to both my left-right mix and, um, and the one and two, and I'm panning it to two, it's also only going to be sent, it's on the odd rail, so that also means it's only going to be coming down the right-hand side, if I'm sending it to both of those. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Or do you want me to run through that again? So if you have it, in fact, you have it to the left, is the sound only going to come out of the left side, or is that only related to this? Yes. If I have, question is, if, if I have it only panned to the left, is the sound only going to come out of the left side? Um, and that's dependent on if I'm sending to my primary mix bus, which is a left and a right, or if I'm just sending to a subgroup. Um, so I can actually do a quick um, actual audio demonstration on this. Um, so right now, Hey, 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 check, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna turn this up. Um, you should be able to hear this in the live stream. You guys can hear it right here. Um, so right now, I'm only sending to um, my primary mix bus, my left and a right. So we've got a left and a right speaker. So if I pan only left right now, you're only gonna hear it out of the left speaker. Um, and hopefully this is translating to the stream. Um, if I pan it to the right, now you're only gonna hear it out of the right speaker, okay? So now I'm gonna unassign it from my primary mix bus. Okay, which one thing you'll notice, you can see on the camera, I'm still seeing signal on my channel. You can see it coming in, but I don't have it assigned to any mix bus. So that's why I'm not hearing it, because it's not going anywhere. It's coming right here, and it's stopping until it knows where to go. So now I'm going to assign it to um, my one and two mix bus, which is this right here, these subgroups. Um, I'm going to unmute them, bring them up to zero. Um, and the reason I'm not hearing them right now is because this one gives you the ability to assign these groups if you want these to flow straight through to your primary mix bus or say these are feeding um, uh, various recording feeds or other sets of speakers that they're not necessarily tied to my main speakers if that makes sense um, but if I want to I can send group one to left right now you're gonna hear uh, the left side and group two to left right now you hear it coming out of the speakers so basically what's happening I'm routing this through these and then these are being sent to my main bus so if I take these out you're not going to hear anything, okay? So again, now, um, if I send these now, if I pan to left or right, so I just pan hard left or to the odd side, you're still hearing it out of both speakers. So if I take this even side down, it's not affecting anything at all because it's panned completely to the even side. Um, and this is not a left or a right mix. It's just a mono. It's being sent out the, the same out of both sides. Um, now, if I take this side down, okay, turn this, the even side back up, you're not hearing that at all because it's sent to the even side or to the odd side. Um, now if I pan it over the even side, now you're hearing it out the even side. Okay, now to answer your question about if it's going to come out left and right, if I decide to send this back, right now it's unassigned from my primary mix bus. If I assign it back to my primary mix bus, you're going to hear it get a little bit louder because now it's being routed twice as much. There's, again, a doubling 60B increase just by having it dual routed like that. Um, and if you look at these meters actually slightly, right now you're still hearing it out of both because this even rail on the subgroup is still feeding both speakers. But if I take that out, now it's only the primary mix bus and now it's only the right hand side. So on my primary mix, because it's panned to the even side, the right's the even, it's only coming out of the right hand side. Okay? Now I know, I know it's a little bit, again routing is probably on some consoles can be one of the most difficult things to kind of get your head around. Um, and later, we can probably go ahead and do some hands-on. You can play with it. Um, and this is, again, this style, this is the same on, on the majority of consoles. Um, but essentially, um, what you're looking for, again, it's, it's a routing matrix. 
your pan is panning between odd and even rails. And those odd and even rails could be left and right, it could be one and two, three and four. Um, it's basically whatever you patch it as, if that makes sense. Cool? Cool? Sweet. Um, yeah, so that's, so that's panning pots. Like I said, way more complicated than people give them credit for. <laughs> um, sweet. So next, we're going to move down. We're going to move down. Um, and we've got faders. Um, misconception about faders, they do not actually turn signal up. Again, if you remember, where is the signal actually turned up? Up at the preamp, right? That's where you're getting your level from. And that's why a lot of times if you look at the actual numbers on faders, um, zero is way up here near the top. Because technically what you're actually doing um, is limiting the amount of signal that's let out. Um, it's, almost, it's almost like a, uh, again, like a, like a limiter, like a be confused with an actual limiter or gate. Um, but basically, again, you're allowing, um, you're deciding how much of the signal is allowed to come out of that channel. So you've gained it up, you've got it to a usable level up at the top, um, and then this is now deciding how much of that volume level you're going to let come out. Okay? So faders actually turn things down, if that makes sense. Okay? A little tricky. Um, but anyways, 0 dB, um, so if I were to set this fader at the 0 dB line on here, that means that it is passing the signal unaffected. It's not boosting it, it's not turning it down. Um, so again, jumping back to earlier, you could almost think of this like a trim, because technically, it only gives me the ability to turn it up on this console. I can only boost 10 dB with the fader, that's it. It doesn't let me go any farther. But I can turn it down uh, infinity dB. <laughs> no, like I can, I can cut it completely off to where it's not passing any signal at all. Um, and then, but faders do have an optimum range. I'm being, again, if you look at the numbers on it, um, let's say the physical distance, if I move, um, you know, let's say a centimeter from the very bottom up here, that moves me from negative infinity to negative 30. That's a pretty big jump from negative infinity to wherever that is, to negative 30. Now, if I, that same centimeter of distance up here during the top um, is only a difference of about 5 dB. So if I go at zero, and at the same distance it takes me um, from negative infinity to 30, it's going to take me from zero to five. So basically when I get in that optimum range, there's actually, I can now, I have a more focused control over one little bump isn't going to, you know, make the sound, you know, 200 times louder. It's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a fine tune, it's a controlled. Um, so a lot of times this also comes into set and gain. If you have such a loud signal, is having to ride down here near the bottom, um, you're, you're going to barely bump the fader and make a world of difference. You really don't have that fine amount of control, if that makes sense. Um, whereas if you get it up here in the optimum range, you can actually kind of ride your faders musically and you can actually have some play with them that's, that's effective, um, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, so again, contrary to popular belief, faders turn things down, preamps turn things up. Cool? So are you yes. Yes and no. That there is um, the whole argument on gain structure. There's again kind of two different camps on that, and both are correct, and both have their. And one says, okay, set your fader at zero, um, and turn your gain up until you get the level that you want. Um, okay, and that's great um, until your gain starts affecting more than just you. So you're affecting monitor mixer stuff. If I have my fader all the way up at zero, um, and I barely touch my gain, all right, cool, I'm happy, that's great. But now the guy in his monitor, I'm having to crank his aux to 150% to be able to get him to hear that because the signal really isn't gained up that loud. Um, but again, if all I'm worried about is my primary mix bus here, what's going to the speakers, then I'm in a happy world, that's phenomenal, that's great. Um, the other camp is um, to, to use your gain to set um, your input to be coming in at an analog zero level. So you have LED metering when, you're, when your level's coming in, and you get that set around zero, so that gets a, an optimum range on the preamp, um, and then your fader you set accordingly, and you can compensate if it's too loud. Um, you can compensate with like the overall system volume and things like that, um, but the structure through the console um, is, is consistent so that you have a usable level for everybody. Um, again, that's a whole nother discussion in itself. Um, but yeah, so I mean, for, for me personally, again, this is not the way, this is not the standard, but for me personally, what I found works best in search circles because most of the time, um, you know, unless you have a separate monitor console, um, your gain from your front of house console is affecting everybody's monitors. So I've personally found it is best to get a zero level um, gain from your preamp up at the top um, and then 
uh, your, your system level and all that, compensate if it's too loud, too soft, compensate that way as opposed to the gain because the gain affects your entire, the entire setup, if that makes sense. Um, cool. Did you have a question also? Question yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. So they're technically, I know I said they turn things down. That's what they're, they're meant to do. They do have the ability um, to open up wider and actually add, add signal level um, to what's coming in. So essentially if I have, um, and again, just like we talked about, the decibels are relative. There, there's no fixed value. So my 0 dB on my fader is dependent on my preamp. So that, that could mean different things. Dependent. It could equate to different volume levels depending on where my preamp is at if that makes sense. So now if I put my preamp, if I get a zero level from that and put this at zero, and that's called unity all the way across. I'm not cutting or boosting. The signal that you're hearing um, is coming straight from the preamp, unprocessed, all the way through. Cool? Uh, but yeah, so the faders do have the ability. As soon as I jump into the positive domain on there, it is actually adding a bit of volume. Um, but I will tell you, the preamps are designed to cut volume. The faders are designed to cut volume. So if you're going to add volume, it's usually best to add it from the circuit that's designed to add volume, if that makes sense. And not saying you shouldn't boost from faders, but just usually volume on the preamp side will sound a bit better than if you're compensating using faders. Um, and again, there's only 10 dB of compensation there, so you really can't do too much harm. <laughs> um, cool, so that is faders. Um, we're gonna jump to VCAs, DCAs, and subgroups. Um, this is important because I think a lot of people um, slightly misunderstand the difference between these, and it's really not difficult. Um, but a lot of people just haven't taken the time to learn the difference. Um, so a VCA is a voltage-controlled amplifier, um, and it is important, a VCA does not pass audio. Um, so, for example, on a digital console over here, which, really quick, DCAs are digitally controlled amplifier. It is the digital equivalent of a VCA. Um, this is analog. It is working in actual power and voltage, and that's literally what's happening um, under the hood, whereas so is this, but it's being controlled with DSP, not pure analog circuitry, um, DSP being digital signal processing. So it's being the analog, um, the analog circuits that are present in here are being controlled um, and manipulated using digital signal processing. Um, so being ones and zeros, it converts it into ones and zeros, changes them, and then at some stage it converts it back to an analog signal. So there's actually, um, again, quick little rabbit trail. Basically under the hood here, if you were to pop this up, it is all um, series of analog circuits, you know, printed circuit boards with actual um, components soldered together. That is what's happening. Whereas here, um, a digital console, it really is a computer. It comes in analog, um, and there is an A to D, an analog to digital conversion that happens at the beginning, converts it all into ones and zeros. It's all processed like a computer. Um, and then before it comes back out to your speakers, it's converted back into an analog signal to feed your speakers. So all the processing that's actually happening is all computerized as digital. Um, hence, digital console. <laughs> now, assume, yes? Since we use a digital console mm -hmm. in the main auditorium, that there's a benefit to the digital benefit. Yes, that is, a, again, a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> um, the biggest benefit to digital is flexibility. Um, again, this right here, this is a 24 channel console. These are the 24 channels I have. These are the EQs I have, and it is what it is. Um, digital console gives me the ability um, to where not only you know do I have this same type of um, EQ and that type of thing on every channel. Um, because it's a smaller footprint, um, you can fit way more. These are physically about the same size. This has almost twice as many inputs as this one does and about uh, three times the amount of outputs it has. Um, and it is in a significantly smaller footprint as well as all the stuff that's in the front of the rack is also all inside of there. So the biggest um, benefit to digital is um, the, the footprint, the physical footprint, as well as the flexibility. Um, there's, a, again, a huge massive argument over sound quality and all that kind of stuff, which is valid, but we're not going to get into it today. <laughs> um, but okay, so back to VCAs, DCAs, and subgroups. Um, again, VCAs and DCAs, they do not pass audio. Um, essentially, what they're doing is acting as a remote control for a group of faders. Um, so if, um, if we hit subgroups real quick, a subgroup, um, again, it's a submix of inputs. Um, so if you've ever, you know, on a console, you've got subgroups, and you say, hey, I've got eight mics on my drums. If I want to turn them up or down, I don't want to have to try to move all eight faders and keep them all in line with each other. It would be nice if I just had one of all those and kept the ratio of the eight to each other the same. So I'm basically treating them as a group. A subgroup does that. You can, you basically take those eight faders, you mix them down, or two, you know, however you want to do it, 
um, and then now you can turn that up or down. The difference is um, that a VCA and a DCA, it controls that group of faders, but it is literally um, acting as a remote control. This, you know, let's say I set this up as, as a VCA um, to these eight faders over here, okay? So me with a, with a DCA, this is a digital console, so we'll keep our terminology straight. I'm gonna set all these at zero, okay? Uh, yep, so now this is all at zero. If I take this DCA, say all eight of these faders are assigned, um, and I pull this down to negative 10, okay? That is the exact same thing as me leaving that at zero and pulling all of these down to negative 10, okay? It's literally remote control. This right here is not, the audio is not being mixed down and routed through here. This is not a mix. It's, it's a DCA. It's a remote control, okay? The difference, let me hop over to this console real quick. These are actual subgroups. Um, these will actually pass audio. So when I assign, let's do the same thing. Say I take these eight faders, I put them at zero, okay? And I'm gonna assign them all to subgroup one and two, okay? So, and now again, if I want them just on one, I pan all these left, now they're all just on one. Okay, in fact, I'm gonna do that just for kicks. Um, so I'm gonna pan, these are all being mixed down. They're not being sent to my main left-right mix. They're just being sent to this red fader right here, which is a subgroup, not a VCA, not a DCA. So what this means is that, again, these little buttons are actual mixed buses. So it's literally taking the combined audio outputs of all eight of these channels, mixing them down on one mix bus, and now right here. Now volume-wise, it has the same effect. If I turn this down, I don't, I don't hear these eight channels anymore. But these eight channels are still outputting unity level two here. This, this is not the same as me pulling these down and pushing that up. Okay, in that case, it's literally remote control. It's just the exact same function controlled from a different place. In here, this is actually, okay, I'm gonna output you know, a pretty hot level of audio here, and it's all gonna run into this mix bus. Now let's say, subgroup, I could, let's say I put a compressor over the whole thing. Okay, on a subgroup, I could put a compressor or an EQ or something on this EQ, all eight of these faders uh, as a whole. So my whole drum mix, I could go boost the low on on everything over the whole drum mix. Instead of going and boosting it on every single channel, I could route them all down to a subgroup, and now I can EQ and compress that group as its own, almost like its own channel. On a DCA or a VCA, you can't do that. You cannot put an EQ, you cannot put a compressor or anything like that because it's not passing any audio. It's just remotely controlling those, those faders. Does that make sense? The difference between subgroups and VCAs, DCAs. So yeah. is effect the um, effects would be one reason also like parallel processing so again maybe um, uh, parallel processing being let's say I mix all you know I mix my drums down and let's say they are being sent to my main mix bus so they're coming out of the speakers left right they sound great they're punchy they're good um, but maybe I want to there's you know this technique parallel compression where maybe they all sound great but now I want to I want to process the entire kit as one instrument for a little bit so okay so I'm gonna mix these all down also to this fader. I'm gonna insert a compressor on that subgroup. And now I'm gonna just squash the heck out of the drums. I'm gonna compress them so that they're really pumping and breathing, which we'll get into what compression actually is um, here pretty soon. But basically I'm gonna compress it, I'm gonna take their whole dynamic range, um, squash it to here, and turn the whole thing up. So now I get this kind of energy, this live out of them by layering this in there with them. Um, effects could be another, because you could, um, you could route, you know, all, say all your background vocals to a subgroup, and then route that subgroup to an effect. Now you're only using um, one instance of that reverb instead of, you know, however many backup vocalists you have. Um, so, but yeah, so effects is one use. Um, Submixing to be able to process as a group. You know, a lot of people, especially in the analog world, um, again, Dave Ratt, um, Red Hot Chili Peppers engineer, brain behind the majority of EAW products. Um, he has a whole strategy, actually, that he set up, which you can find it on YouTube. It's actually pretty cool. Um, he basically routes, he routes everything down through a subgroup. So he has vocals, um, kick and snare, bass, guitars, um, and uh, something else. I can't remember. But he routes all his in inputs into these subgroups. Um, and then he feeds all the subgroups into groups of compressors that basically almost automate the volume from. So the more you know, say he pushes up, like here's a good example. Let's say I route my drums to subgroup one and two. Okay, and let's say I put a compressor on that. Um, if, I, if I route, if I start pushing these volume levels up, it's gonna push into that group harder, in turn gonna push into the compressor harder. So it's gonna make my compressor affect it more because I'm turning up the level that's going into that. 
if I do that on a DCA, it's not, there's no compression, there's no anything audio happening on that. Doing, pushing all these up here is the same as me just pushing that up. It's purely volume. That's another good way to think about it. DCAs and VCAs, just controlling volume. That, that's all it is. It's volume control over multiple faders. Cool. Does that make sense? Sweet. Um, our next one, and I think, yeah, one of our last one um, is matrices, or matrices. I don't, I know in math it's called matrices, um, but we're going to call it matrices today because <laughs> um, <coughs> this ain't math. No. Um, but uh, matrices are basically, okay, so best way to think about it is an, is an auxiliary mix is a mix of inputs. Take your inputs, you send them out. A matrix is a mix of outputs, okay? Um, so this um, up here is a matrix. Um, which again we can look at this on the break um, but for those of you seeing on the live stream um, if you look on here um, what I have the ability to mix into this matrix um, is all my output so it has on here um, my four groups one two three and four my left and a right and then a master output level so just like an input I have the ability to turn up any of my inputs into that mix and send it out a matrix gives me the ability to dial in any amount of my output so maybe I have you know uh, five different mixes here one two three four um, and then a fifth one on my main. And I want to combine those into an output to feed maybe a broadcast feed or a, um, a cry room or something where maybe they don't want the band as hot or something like that. Um, a matrix gives me the ability to mix together my outputs into an additional mix, if that makes sense. So an aux is a mix of inputs, a matrix is a mix of outputs. Um, one of the things personally that I really like using matrices for um, is um, for processing my PA. Again, earlier we talked about um, how system EQ matches the speakers to the room. Okay, So if you follow me on this, if I put, let's say, you know, I put my speakers in a the room, they sound terrible. I need to put an EQ on them to even them out and all that. If I put the EQ um, on my master mix going out, that means that all of my inputs are feeding through that and then getting EQ'd for the room to come out of the speakers, which is good. But as soon as I want to copy that mix to, um, to get recorded, or to get sent to another room or to go to a live broadcast, all of my EQ that I'm doing for that room is all on that main mix. So that means someone who's record listening to the recording that's not in that room is hearing all these EQ changes that are just for that room. It's not, again, it wasn't a, a channel um, issue. You know, maybe it was boomy in the room, but it was because of the room um, and not the microphone. So they're going to hear all this missing low end because I carved it all out for the room. But in reality, it doesn't sound bad. It's just the room. So what a matrix gives you the ability to do is, okay, I'm going to route my main mix to this matrix to be sent out, and then I'm going to put my EQ on this matrix. So now it's still, and then I go from the matrix to my speaker. So the EQ is doing what it needs to do for the speakers in the room, but my main mix bus is still clean. So now I'm to another place. Okay, I'll use you know, matrix number two. Now I'm going to send a completely clean mix of all my inputs out to the broadcast, and then they can EQ it for their room or for whatever they need. Does that make sense? Um, and again, that's just kind of a preference thing, um, but that's part of the reason, like, you know, here at Northlands in our auditorium, we feed the PA from a matrix. So right now, you know, we have a main left and right, um, we've got side fills, and we've got subs, and each of those requires a different bit of EQ for where they're placed in the room and all that. So if I were to do it all off my main mix bus, I've, I've got one shot at it for all five mixes. You know, I've got a mix going to our main PA, I've got side fill mix, and we've got a mix, different mix going to our subwoofers. Um, so if I'm feeding all those from my main, my main, my primary mix bus, then that EQ is going to hit all of them. And it's, does that make sense? Whereas if I do it from a matrix, now, okay, my side fill speakers are completely different make and model from our main ones. So obviously they're going to need to be EQ'd differently because the speakers sound different and they're in a different spot of the room. So by doing it off of a matrix, it gives me the ability to mix together my outputs and then EQ them specifically for that, for that output, for that speaker. Does that make sense? So again, basic takeaway, a mix of outputs. So when you see that, that's what a matrix does. Cool? Any questions on that? Good? Sweet. Um, so we're going, huh? Oh, okay. Too many questions. Too many questions. <laughs> cool. Well, I think we're going to take a lunch break. I think it's on its way back. And when we get back, we're going to talk about elements of a mix.